my it's more a like gamble from our permaculture life and a permaculture education institute and it's my great pleasure to be here today with rob hopkins in, hello in totness actually welcome a, yeah thank you <laughs> it's been about 20 years since i was here and okay i don't think um transition town totness was happening back no then, it didn't exist it? no it's been about 12 years yeah yeah so um, the focus that I have in, in the work that I do and, and all the materials that I create is around permaculture. And I know that that's kind of where you started with the whole transition yeah. town. So could you take us just back in back Tell you in my history. permaculture story. Yeah, maybe. That would be a good place to start. Okay, with. so when I was about 22, 23 or something like that, I went travelling uh, in India and Pakistan mm. and China and travelled up through the Karakoram Mountains mm. and and uh, was travelling with a guy called Chris who was from Mullaney and who lived at oh. Crystal Waters Permaculture Village. Really? That's where I'm from. Chris, uh, Chris Gwynn. Chris? No way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Are you not? You're kidding me, really? No, I've travelled with Chris, yeah. Oh, my god. Because Chris is Buddhist and we were, we both met in Dharamsala. He's my neighbour. Is your neighbour? <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's a small world. <laughs> it is a small world. Isn't so it? Chris like and I say. and somebody else a guy called Dave, so we travelled through uh, up through Pakistan, yeah. and Chris at the time was writing, he would send little sort of, uh, like little mini articles back for the, his local permaculture magazine yeah, or right. something like that, and every time we arrived anywhere with apricot trees, he got very excited oh, and started cool. writing, writing these things, and he kept talking about permaculture this and permaculture yeah. that, I had no idea what he was talking about, and we went to the Hunza Valley, oh, which is, oh, which, which I now recognise as being one of the great yeah. original permacultures yeah. and uh, he was like beside himself with permaculture fervor <laughs> and dashing about and writing off these articles about how amazing it all was and and I because I didn't know what permaculture was but I remember it had a real impact on me that place mm. I'd never been anywhere that felt so kind of um, kind of content or sort of resilient yeah. and sort of there was something really extraordinary about it that had a real impression on me. I, th I think a, kind of a similar experience I had was um, spending time up in Ladakh. And yeah, it, I'm sure. So I, I went up there in about 1992 and spending you know, almost a year over a period of two years there and mm. it had a similar impact on me. Like, oh, this is what it means to live well. Yeah, you know? this exactly. Is, you know, it's, it is, it's content, people are content, it's simple, it's natural materials, natural food. Great community, excellent music, lots yeah. of fun. And I, I just went, what are we doing? <laughs> <laughs> we should do it like that. Uh, yeah, so I... Um, so then when I got... So I travelled with Chris. He kept talking about permaculture. I had no idea what he was talking about. Then when I got back to England, a friend of mine gave me a copy of the designer's manual. Just like, oh, Rob, you might enjoy this. Like a big thing. <laughs> Like a really nice present, so you might enjoy this. So, and it completely blew me away. It was like that that concept of earth repair. Mm. I was like, wow, someone's written a book about earth repair. That's just amazing. So then I found there was a permaculture group in Bristol, and I kind of harassed them until they organised a design course. And then I did the design course, which kind of rewired my mm. brain mm. really. And then I can we, just, can we just stop there for a minute? Like, what, when you say rewired your brain, I hear a lot of people saying that. You know, what is it about permaculture courses that you think helps to rewire people's brains? What is it that shifts? What well, the way I, the way I talk about it is is um, in the transition handbook. I wrote about it as being like a really awful B movie I saw called They Live. Have you ever seen a film called They Live? <laughs> it's hilarious, and it's it's. But the beginning of it is beautiful. It's this guy going down this alleyway and he finds this box full of old, full of sunglasses mm -hmm. and he takes out these sunglasses and he kind of puts them on. And when he puts them on, he can see the world in a completely different way. So he can see that actually half the people are, are, are aliens <laughs> and all the adverts that say things like, you know, get shinier hair with whatever, say, consume and die. And he's like, oh, and he puts them on and off. And then, and it's like, and for me, it was like that. It was like, yeah. it, it gave me my kind of... Um, possibilities glasses yeah. of looking at things in a very different way yes, and lovely. looking at spaces and thinking mm, actually it doesn't have to be like that yeah. it could be like this mm. and it gave me the tools to be able to think well what it could be like mm. uh, I think that was and 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 it and it, and it rewires your brain to think in systems and connection mm. rather than isolation isolating yeah. things down which yeah. is very much the culture we grew up in I think yeah. so uh, so then 
Then I did a degree that was the first sort of sustainability degree at the time, which thank God I did a permaculture course first, because otherwise I think I would have jumped off a bridge halfway through. But actually, was, I, meet, I meet some of the tutors occasionally, and they mm. say it was so great, because we learned loads from yeah, right. the fact I was, they, I'd be going, um, um, what about reed beds? What about whatever, you know? And then, uh, then we moved to Ireland and basically mm. spent 10 years just mm. sort of trying stuff out. Yeah, so we yeah. did a kind of eco-village project yeah. and built cob houses. And at the Kinsale College, I started the first two-year full-time permaculture yeah. course. Yeah, that sounds amazing. Which was, a, yeah, which was amazing. In, in, well, and it's only really coming here, mm. I really see how amazing it was. Yeah, yeah. You know, that actually there is this little fertile edge in the Irish oh, education yeah. system mm. with this very visionary principal who mm. I went to and said, I've got this idea, John. For this course, I had a friend of mine who already taught drama yeah. there, and I said, I've got this idea for a course. And uh, he said, Oh, what would that be? And I said, It'd be permaculture, be like this. And he'd never heard of permaculture mm. before. He said, Yeah, how many people would you, know, how many people do you think mm. would want to do it? And I said, Well, how many do you need? He said, Well, if you had 15, we could run it the first year. So the first year we had 24, oh, and then every year after that we had 40, and wow. we could have filled it twice. Wow. Wow. And we built forest gardens mm. and gardens. We and then the last year I was there, we built a theatre, a whole mm. theatre out of all mm. materials from within five miles of the town: cob, cordwood, roundwood, oh, poles, plasters. It was fantastic. So, why do you think people were attracted to do a, a two-year course in permaculture in Ireland? Because I know in Australia, people would love to do it, but they get to the point of thinking, "What well, if I spend two years doing this? What's what kind of work can I create then? What's the job? You know, there's no kind of." job called that and people get stuck on that yeah. I think and it and it's always still stayed in that kind of the hobby realm it's actually well, get people to spend two years to do it that's a significant commitment thing. yeah yeah. yeah well it was it was it was a one year course mm. and then in the last year I was there we added a second year yeah, on because okay. a lot of people just they really liked it. that they yeah. were like can we can we do some more please yeah, yeah. so so the, so the heart of it was a one year course that mm. was like an expanded design course with loads of practical yeah, stuff right. yeah. um why did people do it? I think it was it was in Ireland you could do a course like that for free yeah, okay. because of adult education yeah. and and it was great. Mm. And no, I, it was like I, I had the opportunity to design the permaculture course I would have really liked to yeah, do. Yeah. Yeah. And we went to see loads of great projects and loads yeah. of trips and, yeah. and uh, but yeah, I don't know what Do you I know got, what people started to do after they did that course? Did they go out and create uh, new Enterprises or just transform their places? I think at the time, I don't think there was a particular... I think that kind of emphasis that says, OK, how can we create enterprises mm. and livelihoods out of this mm. wasn't such a big part of no, it. Right. And actually now, we certainly with the transition movement, we kind of brought that in a lot more strongly, I think. But at yeah. the time, yeah, there are some people who went off and did... Um, who went off and maybe started natural building yeah, companies yeah. or... Garden. There's a lot of quite a lot of people then have actually settled around Kinsale oh, okay. and have started interesting businesses. Yeah. So there's some good kind of CSAs yeah. and vegetable yeah. grow production stuff, you know. So it's like you build. It's a bit like like with Totnes, yeah. where you've had Dartington Art College for years, yeah. and so there's loads of people stay, and then you've got a much more creative so it town. Seeds a new culture. Yeah, so exactly. So that is what transition's all about, really, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So how did you how did you transition from that to, to that where you are now? So I was teaching permaculture, and permaculture was my main sort of everything, I suppose. And then in 2004, so we'd, we were doing an eco-village project mm. with another family, and we were, were two, the first two houses were being built. We were building cob houses. We were the first new cob houses built for 100 years or something in Ireland. And oh, really? That's quite significant. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And there was loads of volunteers and woofers and people yeah. helped out in yeah. building them. And so our house was about six months off being finished. And then around that October, I had all sort of different things happened at once. So I had my kind of, I can't remember what it was that triggered it. I had my sort of climate change sort of dark night mm. of the soul. You know, mm. I was like, we well, really thinking, wow, okay. Mm. Um, and... Uh, and then someone burnt our house down. We had an uh, we had an arson attack on this house that we'd spent two years building, oh, no. which was the most beautiful thing. It was really really traumatic oh, sort I of bet. period of time. Oh. So and then and then also I was reading David Holmgren's David Holmgren's book came out. Yeah, right. Prin P Principles, Principles and Pathways Beyond Sustainability. Yes. So I had a friend who was living with us at the time, and we were both reading it. And then we'd meet up for breakfast mm. every morning and discuss mm. every chapter. And that that kind of that sort of blew my mind, that book. 
because it really sort of put permaculture right back. It just sort of felt like it just sort of drifted off. Mm. And he put it right back in the middle and said, no, this is the design system yeah, for yeah. the energy crisis and the climate crisis. Yeah. And it was so skillful and rich. And mm. I always say it's like the most delicious chocolate cake you've ever had. You can't just eat it all in one go. You have to have really thin little <laughs> slices so and go and lie down in a dark room yeah. between each one and let it digest a, it's it. It's a bit know. like the, the original, you know, the permaculture designers manage. Well, you can't just sit down and read that either. No. Or retrosuburbia for that matter, which has come out recently. Well, if you can lift that <laughs> off the table without giving yourself a hernia. <laughs> Yeah. But yeah, I, I, I totally. I don't <laughs> so, know what you're saying about that. So, so, so we had this then this period of like, of eight months of thinking. Well, well, now, well, now what do we do? Mm. You know, and uh, the last. So I had a year. I had that year's course still to teach. Mm. You know, so the way. So all of that sort of chaos at the in like October mm. over the year was sort of digested and turned into a project that I gave the second year students mm. which was to say okay your main project for the rest of this year is if the town of Kinsale were to over 20 years make the journey from where it is now completely oil dependent mm. for everything to a place where that wasn't the case anymore mm. How would it do that? Mm -hmm. How would you tell that story? What would it look like? And can we design what that would look like year yeah. by year? So I gave different combinations of students, right? You three, you're doing food. You guys are doing tourism. You guys are doing education. Mm -hmm. You guys are doing whatever. And, uh, you know, and this is, and to see this as an enormous mm -hmm. opportunity. So they went off and then they did these projects. And over the year, we went to see interesting things mm -hmm. and researched lots of stuff. And so at the end, they all set, they all handed in their assignments mm -hmm. at the end of the year, which were this kind of, timetable like uh, telling the story and I got and I had all these things and I marked them all and did all that teacher stuff and I thought actually this is amazing mm. I'd never seen anything like this before so mm. then I so I wrote like a forward introducing a project mm -hmm. and I produced it so put them all together so they were like a little book and then I used the last bit of my budget and just printed 500 copies of this thing. So the last thing I did before I left Ireland and came here was we organised a conference called Fueling the Future that oh, was a kind of right. peak oil yeah. climate conference. And Richard Heinberg came as oh, one yeah. of the speakers. Yeah. And we, we had this thing that we'd made and we had these copies and we didn't formally launch it or anything. Mm. We just had them almost apologetically <laughs> on for sale at the back of the hall. You know, the Kinsale Energy Descent Action Plan, we called it. And it was on the table at the back of the hall and Richard, I gave Richard a copy and he took it away to where he was staying. He came back the next mm. morning and he said, that is amazing. Mm. That is the missing piece that mm. we've all been waiting wow. for. That is absolutely brilliant. And he mm. took a whole load of copies with him back to America. He wrote about it. Yeah. We put it online. Someone in Australia ordered a hundred copies. Yeah, well, it was really, uh, particularly around the Sunshine Coast area. I don't know if Janet Millington and the whole Sunshine Coast transition town movement was massive. And it yeah. Through our councils and everything. And I, I just, I, I, so so that's the hundred went off in a box yeah, to Australia, yeah, right. yeah. and then and then we put it online. It was downloaded thousands of times. So then we moved here in two thousand and five, kind of with nothing really, mm. but thinking, yeah, there was something in that project that mm. was really interesting. And then some of the students who were in Kinsale stayed on in yeah. Kinsale, and. They came up with this term transition town mm. to carry on, to, which was basically, okay. a, it was a name that referred to them trying to make that energy descent plan a reality. Yeah. And they took it to the town council who said, we endorse this and we'll give you 5,000 euros to do something wow. with it. You know? So then things just started taking yeah, off here yeah. really. Yeah. That's brilliant. Gosh. And so now, so you know you're in Totnes and you've been here for quite some time and Totnes was already quite an interesting town already so maybe receptive ground for some change i'd be interested to hear yeah. how you've how you've seen towns um that are because because i come from a laney area and so similarly we have this kind of receptive ground for, for yeah. new ideas so if you were to go into a into a town or there's a few people in a town where there's not much happening already how have you seen transition town kind of emerge in those different contexts because yeah. i'm asking this question because I was just giving, um, talking into the Beyond Development course up at Schumacher College and the students, we were, we were exploring all these different ideas. They said, yeah, that's really great. I love it. I'd love to see it. But I can just see in my town, I don't even know where to start. <laughs> I can't even imagine where I can begin with this. And so I guess I'm kind of bringing that, that question um, to this conversation to sort of yeah. think about well, if it's a really, you're starting from the very start, what are some of the things that kind of spark the imagination of that community or the, the interest in in starting on this journey. Yeah. Um, 
So, uh, so I think that th one of the important things about um, about Totnes is, yeah, it is a it's a place that has a long history of being a sort of mm. creative, sort of different place. And a friend of mine did a PhD a while ago that said, "Well, why is that?" Mm. And uh, and it, and it's kind of various things in the in the town's history. But one of the things he pointed out was that he said you know, across the UK there are six or seven what he called laboratory towns. Mm -hmm. So Hebden Bridge, Stroud, Lewis, Totnes, places like that, yeah. which have a history of being attracting maybe a higher number of sort of culturally mm -hmm. creative people. Mm -hmm and being quite tolerant and far enough away from London to ve develop their own kind of identity. Mm. And they're places where people try stuff out, like Mulaney, and if they don't work, then it's just another mad idea from <laughs> Mulaney. <laughs> uh, but sometimes those ideas do take off, yeah. and then they spread everywhere. So the yeah. first vegetable box scheme in the UK was came from here. Yeah, right. The first let scheme was here. The first transition project was yeah. here. You know, yeah. So uh, I like to think of us as the sort of Silicon Valley of resilience. <laughs> That's wonderful. But with better coffee. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, uh, yeah, so I've forgotten what your question oh, so was. My yeah? question was really about... Oh, other towns. Other yeah, town, how you get how started. Yeah, yeah. So there's a list somewhere of, mm. of, of sort of places that became transition towns mm. and the order they did it. So the first 10 or 15 were the kind of places you'd expect, yeah. you know, Totnes, Brixton, Stroud, whatever. Yeah. And then it and then it kind of carried on spreading out into all kinds of different mm. places. And actually, there's lots of places where it has happened that you really wouldn't think would be that kind of place. And I think uh, you know now we always say that transition is an experiment, and mm. it's been a 12-year experiment. Mm. And we run on a spirit of we don't know how to do it, mm. but if enough people have a go, maybe we can. <laughs> maybe together we can figure it yeah, out. Yeah. So do you, have you had any when it all started back in Kinsale? You probably had no idea. No, not at all. <laughs> so how does that feel? Not at all. Like, what, what do you think were kind of the key things that have sparked people's interest in it so much that that it's just become this global phenomenon, really? Yeah, sometimes people imagine that we was like we sort of plotted it like mm -hmm. some sort of you know Uber startup or something. You know, initially the idea here was could we come up with something that might work here in this town? Mm. That was only that was mm. the motivation, and then all even when we had the launch event here. Mm in 2006 in September there were people who turned up here mm. from like Falmouth and mm. London and all sorts mm. of places and it's like how it's only how have you they even heard about it because yeah, right. all there was at the time was a little blog that I was doing called yeah. Transition Culture and uh, yeah it's amazing so what it's about like the such idea extraordinary you is so appealing to people I think I, I think I, 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 feel it but I'm, I'm interested to know what you think yeah I think it was something that was really timely mm. because at the time there were lots of people who were really waking up to mm. what was happening in terms of climate change and and uh, and all the various other things mm. and that a lot of the responses that were out there were very fear-based mm. responses yeah. what do we do uh, we go up into the mountains with four years worth of baked beans and toilet paper and mm. firearms you know yeah. and somehow that's a solution yeah. and <clears throat> and I think because transition said no 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 we yeah. figure this out where we are yeah. with the people around us yeah. and we figure this out by rebuilding social connections yeah. and we figure this out by coming together rather than going further apart mm. and with a model which is based as which is a compassionate response to this crisis yeah. um, and which has a degree of humility built into mm -hmm. it from the beginning that says we don't have all the solutions but maybe mm. we can figure out together yeah. uh, we kind of design transition network from the outset mm. to be very uh, to enable self-organizing, yep. to have a very loose set of mm -hmm. principles and values mm. that people felt they could identify with and sit within. It wasn't onerous to become a transition mm. town, it was quite light touch, but you felt part of a network. And we always said to people, all the stuff is free, it's free, mm. you don't have to pay a membership fee. The only condition is you share your stories. Mm. So it became like a, a network of storytelling story. and exchange. Yeah. And uh, I was often tell the story about how about eight years ago, I got invited up to London by this organization that supports mm. social entrepreneurs. Mm. They rang me up, said, you are a social entrepreneur. Mm. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> And, uh, and the idea was that you would go and you would pitch your whatever your thing was to them. And if they liked it, then they would support you with okay. different way, yeah. different ways. So I went and I presented about transition yes. for 15 minutes. And then there was this long silence in this room with this long glass table and metal chairs. And oh all these guys in shirts are looking at me like a long silence. And this guy said, so, so what you've done basically 
is create a very powerful brand and then give it away for free to people all over the world over whom you have no control whatsoever. <laughs> I said, yeah, yes, exactly. absolutely, that's absolutely what we done. He could not get it at all. He was like, you know, what's your franchise model? Where's the, you know, where's the, where's the leverage, you know, whatever. Did it fit? Did yeah, he fit? could not get his head no. around it at no. all. Um, yeah, so I, th- I think it's because there was something that was, I think people were really hungry for something that said, no, we can do this, yeah. and we can do this at the neighborhood scale, we can do it at whatever level feels possible for us. Yeah. Uh, it should feel fun. Yeah. You know, I think there was a degree of playfulness and yeah. celebration that Transition yeah. brought in that people really valued. Uh, but also, you know, I would, I would really, I would never also underestimate yeah. the amount of uh, hard work that went into it from a lot of people who yeah. were working in Transition at the time. Yeah. You yeah. know, so the, all the travelling and the speaking and the blogging and the films that we yeah, made and course. all of that stuff. You yeah. know, it's like it didn't emerge completely effortlessly yeah. you know no, there was a huge yeah. amount of skill and also i think one of the other reasons that it that it did that, that it took off very quickly was that from the beginning it also had that kind of inner and outer side of it to say this is not purely about soda panels and carrots mm. you know there is also the how we do things matters yeah. as much as yeah. what we do yeah. and how, you know, the, how we do the meetings and make decisions and run events yeah. and all of it having a mindfulness to minimizing burnout and mm. and all of that stuff yeah. was, was a really skillful yeah. addition I think. Yeah. And I mean, I guess, sort of echoing what you're saying, I think the thing about there's some very big issues that we're facing. It's like you're saying, you know, that the dark moment, you know, facing up to yeah. where we're at, that a lot of what we get in, in media is that it's such a big problem and we need big solutions. And all of a sudden, something like Transition Town comes across, the transition movement. And it's something that, well, something that I can do that has meaning and purpose mm. and it's actually making. A positive contribution and and I can see that I can bring my my family and my community along on this journey as well and mm. it, it personalizes and and brings it back down to to here and now and and sometimes that gets belittled you know the kind of the idea of we need big picture activism we need we need big solutions whereas actually it's this multitude of small scale you know positivity and 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 like you said possibilities seeing the possibilities mm. which I guess is where you're kind of Moving now, I can see you've just released a book, hasn't have you? No, it'll be out in September, oh, October. That's recently yeah. almost released a book on yeah. imagination. On it? imagination, which yeah. is exactly what what you're talking about there. It's the possi- you know, that the ability, I suppose, to see the possibilities and to imagine a different future. Is that what yeah. you're talking yeah. about? Yeah. Well, I, f- I, 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 um, I found myself reading more and more people who I really admire, like mm. George Monbiot and Naomi mm. Klein, who kept saying. Climate change is a failure of imagination, mm. and then they'd move off onto something else, and I'd no. be like, "Hey, ha- <laughs> that was really interesting, that bit. What do you mean? It's a failure of the. Ima- Why are we having a failure of the imagination?" Mm. Mm. And then I read this amazing research by a researcher in America who looked at this thing called the Torrance Test for Creative Thinking, which is mm. the sort of gold standard creativity test, going back to the 1960s. Massive data sets mm. in the US. And her conclusion was, and it came out in 2011, this research, that IQ and imagination rose together till the mid-90s, and then mm. IQ kept rising and imagination went into what she called a steady and persistent decline. Oh. And when it was published, this, it was on the front page of Newsweek, yeah. it was a big thing in America. Mm. What does this mean for economic growth? Mm. What does this mean for Hollywood? Mm. I've never heard anyone in the climate change social justice world say, well, what does this mean for us, mm. actually? Yeah. Because if people can't imagine anything mm. other than what's in front of us, mm, right. then we're toast. Yeah, yeah. You know, Margaret Thatcher very powerfully said there is no alternative, you know, and I mm. think those words lodged themselves mm. in our culture, mm. that this is it, this is all there is, there's yeah. nothing else, you know. And so it set me off thinking, well, are we living in a time of imaginative mm. poverty? Mm. Why would that be? Mm. You know, the woman who wrote that report said it was to do with the decline of what she called free and unstructured play. Mm. It was to do yes, with the rise of true. screens and it was to do with the rise of testing in schools. Yes. So I kind of, so that was my starting point. I think it's huh. also to do with we spend a lot less time outdoors in mm. nature. You know, the imp- and the stuff about screens is something which, mm you know, is is the more you look into that, the more mm-hmm. troubling it is, the impact that that's having. Maybe also with that too, because of all those things, a lot less time 
together in conversation. Totally. Through those conversations, then, you know, our imagination is... Absolutely. Is we're, we're living in a time of the decline of conversation. Mm. There's a guy called Sven Burkitz, who I adore, who wrote some great books about mm. attention. What happens to a culture when it loses its attention yeah, span? Right. And he said, he said I, I fear we are losing the very paradigm of depth in our culture because it becomes mm. shallower and shallower and shallower sure. so I've done a lot of looking at you know what are the reasons why this might be happening and yeah. then what would it look like how do you turn mm. that around yeah. as a community how do you bring imagination yeah. back if you were running a country mm. how would you bring about a kind of Just a revival of the imagination yeah how exactly like how would you create a national imagination act oh, wow. To say we're going to we're going to put the reviving of this country's imagination above everything else. Yeah. How what would an education system look like if mm. people left at eighteen with their imaginations mm. like a superpower? Yeah. You know, how would all of that work? Yeah. So yeah, so that's coming out soon. So I'd like to kind of stop, uh, not stop, but um, continue on that thought of the education because yeah, um, one of the main things that I'm working on is is um, creating a platform for permaculture educators, and so there, I'm really interested to hear your insights on where you think maybe we could be working better as permaculture educators or as educators in general. I try and homeschool my kids as much as mm -hmm. I can and, and this whole idea about shifting the way that we focus on education or shifting our focus in education to lifting, uh, like unshackling the boundaries and you know lifting the ceilings and focusing on the curiosities that mm. emerge as we're as we're working with people. So what are your mm. kind of takes on education through, through this perspective you just... Well, you know, I was, in, I was in Belgium last week and I gave a talk in a university there and there was a woman who said, when the question, she said, I, I teach in the engineering department, you know, how could we do what we do so we're more of service mm. to what you're talking about? And I said, um, Get the uh, get the engineering department, ideally the whole university, mm. to declare a climate emergency. Mm. You know, we're seeing the rise of Extinction Rebellion, and their big mm. thing is we want mm. to get the governments to declare a climate emergency. And so they, there's now all sorts of different local district councils mm. who are declaring a climate emergency yeah. because uh, of XR. Ours is one. Okay, yeah. so so then when so then when you declare a climate emergency, mm. then then they they, they they do that, and mm. then they go. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. What now? What do we do? Know. You know, yeah, we've done that bit. We have yeah. no idea what to no. do next. And I said to this woman, imagine mm. if you were teaching a, th a three-year engineering degree mm. through the lens of a climate emergency. Mm. How mm. how differently would you teach it? Mm. I think it would be the most amazing engineering course. Yeah. Imagine yeah. you're like, okay, so uh, uh, you know, you're you're teaching with that sense of. Mm. You know, like the guys who developed the Spitfire mm. in the three years before World War Two, mm. they for nothing they designed and built this mm. plane that was unable to. Mm. So, you, so you're 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 working with people like that. And well, what would an English literature degree look mm. like in the context mm. of a climate emergency? Mm. If a school declares a climate emergency, mm. you know, then you look at everything through that lens. I, I visited a school when I went to Germany a couple of years ago, mm. who had created a. Um, a wildlife garden next mm. to the school. They bought this little bit of a paddock mm. and it had a pond and mm. all sorts of like wildlife stuff. It was great and the kids loved it. Mm -hmm. And I spoke to their teacher and she said, I said, how do you make use of it? She said, well, when we do maths and we want to mm. work out radius and circumference, we send them out to measure a tree. Mm -hmm. If they want to write a, an essay and they want some focus, they go out and they mm. sit under, they go out in the garden. You know, actually they use the garden as a teaching resource mm -hmm. for everything. Yeah. So if you have a school that says we declare a climate emergency, mm -hmm. then you bring in the permaculture mm -hmm. teachers mm -hmm. to teach the kids, and through that, mm -hmm. you teach them maths, and through that, you teach them English, yeah. and through that, you teach them biology. And, mm -hmm. and actually, you're still teaching them the same mm -hmm. stuff, but it's more applied. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I was looking mm -hmm. at when I was researching this book, because it's kind of so outside of my generation's experience, mm -hmm. is what would it look like to live in a time when imagination ran free, you know, when we lived in a time when everything felt possible mm. and, and our imaginations were like, and we could just say, yeah, that's no problem. We could do that. We yeah. can tackle that. And uh, looking back, well, where are there times in history when it felt like the imagination was really free? And the most recent one was a month before I was born in Paris, in like the 1968 student revolution mm -hmm. in Paris in 1968, which was all rooted in art and imagination mm -hmm. and music. And they, mm -hmm. a lot of the graffiti at the time was all about power to the imagination, mm -hmm. imagination taking yeah, power, be realistic, demand the impossible, all yeah. that. And there was some beautiful oral history stuff I found mm -hmm. about people talking about it. And uh, one person said, in those two months, 
you learn more than in the whole of your five years in university yeah. because people talk to each other. Yeah. Anyone felt they could go up and talk to anyone and yeah. talk to your neighbor was graffiti that yeah, people wrote yeah, on the right. walls, wow. you know. And I think yeah. too that it's, it's having a context for learning because often when, you know, I, I, talk, I spend a lot of time um, working in different sort of universities and just I take permaculture into this university mm. or something and, and they kind of come up after and say, that was amazing because, you know, like it was that possibility. They say, mostly we're just kind of learning bits and pieces and it's all just the parts. It's not the connections and mm. it doesn't have that bigger picture. So if you, if you do take, if you do place education in the context, like you're saying, in the context of imagine, you know, you're teaching this from a perspective of climate um, emergency, mm. all of a sudden, <clears throat> everything you start to do is about a bigger picture rather than just getting through year by year to get your marks, to get your job. And I think that's where a lot of people feel stuck. Most of the young mm. people I talk to at the moment, just they're just doing it What's just because, point? but have no real... And even at school, um, my, my little... My, my, um, my little son actually just went back to school last year. He wanted to go to do leadership in grade six. Okay. Very quickly he got incredibly bored and just said, <laughs> I have all these questions and they just yeah. keep telling me to put my hand down. It's not the time to yeah, talk, yeah, not the time yeah. to talk. And so he's coming back out again. We can have lots of great <laughs> conversations. But I th- and the, the learning in learning in context and it doesn't matter what the what it is that you're focusing on, having having the bigger picture and the purpose seems to make all the sense or you know, every yeah. single piece of sense that I can imagine. And I so how are you going to take that forward? Because that sounds phenomenal. Yeah. What's your next step with that? <coughs> well, my next step is I've got to finish this book off, first of all. <laughs> I mean, I... I uh, yeah, I, I, I love the story that I came across re- researching the book about the... the um, Reggio Emilia schools mm, in Italy. Yeah, yeah. Do you know? So, like mm. after the war, when this town, all they had left was a tank and mm. three trucks and six horses. The Germans yeah. left, and then they used the money they to build mm. the school to, to mm. and it was built around this idea of how do you build an education system to make sure fascism never happens again. Mm. Wow. And so, so they, it's all about, you know, seeing the children as mm. being curious, creative, mm. courageous, mm. Uh, um, the authors of their own learning. And every mm. school has what they call an atelier in the mm. heart of it, a maker mm. space, where yep. there's someone there to help you make anything whenever you want to. And uh, it strikes me as interesting that, uh, mm. you know, these people designed a school specifically with that intention mm. around fascism. And now we have an education system that's completely opposite to mm. that. And we're seeing the resurgence of fascism, you know. Yep. Yep. Uh, you know, it's, it feels like it, it's kind of it's pretty obvious what how you educate people if you want them to be imaginative people, and we're doing completely opposite. It's all about driven by tests. So, so their thing is it's about you 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 don't learn by subject, you learn by project, yeah. and. Uh, um, there is a lot of pressure in the UK of so so the the youth strikes for climate, which yeah. I just think are amazing, think and one of their one of their demands is teach us properly about this yeah. stuff, you know. And I think I think there's 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 the maybe the one of the things we need to look at next is about how do we create that something that could just slot into the curriculum. Which I was just about to ask you about because I think that movement that's happening now with all those young people, mm. I kind of feel a sense of connection with whether I mean I'm I'm I was born probably about the similar year as you and I remember going through a whole series of to, to a series of rallies peace rallies there was sort of um, um, Chernobyl was happening there was South whole, Africa oh, there was so much Iraq happening. war as a young teenager there was a sense of of purpose yeah of, totally of being connected to a, a people around the world saying we need something different yeah and this is not what we want and and let's let's kind of come together around that and then everything went quiet for a really long time. I don't feel like there's been much happening mm. in the streets. Well, there hasn't been anyway in Australia. And all of a sudden, this has taken off, and it's phenomenal. It is phenomenal, yeah. And I, you know, so what was that, 15th of March, there was 1.5 million students on the streets, and I'm sure yeah. there's many more in their heart marching totally, yeah. as well. And I, after all that marching and then going to uni, I got this, I, I went into a dark place of thinking, oh, gosh, that's that's what life's about now. And I... And I, it was, it took me quite a while to actually discover how I could make a contribution. It was ending up, you know, through Ladakh and finding permaculture that, oh, mm. okay. So I'm kind of thinking, how can we take permaculture and all the thinking that you're talking about directly to these students? And maybe it's not through the schools, maybe it's through something that's around. Maybe. I don't know. How, how can it be? 
it's, shared with them in a way that's yeah it's a tricky accessible. isn't it because actually I, I i feel like so two of my one of my kids in particular is very involved mm. with the ones around here and i find them really moving to go on mm. i feels to me like i get this feeling of like the reinforcements arrive mm. have arrived right. you yep. know and um and I, and I love Greta Thunberg, you know, who's mm. kind of inspired. I love when the Australian mm. education minister said, you should be in school. And she said, you should be in a museum. Yeah. <laughs> She's got no fear. <laughs> She's which I love. so sassy. I know. Like, you should be in a museum, mate. Yeah. You're a dinosaur. What are you talking about? <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so the, I th- the, there's a kind of a balance for me about mm. actually it's their th- it's their mm. revolution you know uh, it's their thing and uh, so on the one hand i feel like i don't want to be in there going you know you guys all need to be doing permaculture mm. courses and mm. but on the other hand i'm like i really worry that they'll do it for a year and nothing will change mm. and they'll all just drift off and be really and cynical then have a dis- yeah the, that's i guess that's that and cynicism and the disillusionment that comes out of being part of something big and then not having something tangible to yeah, to, move to show forward with. to show as a result to of it. Go, so. Okay, well, we have all this this passion and this commitment to say this is what we don't want, or you know, we want this to stop. But that the story and the image and the vision of what's possible and what's next and the other the other potential futures. Yeah. I'm just, I'm not sure how to do it. That's why I'm kind of asking you because what do you yeah. think about it as well? I've been spending a lot of time chatting with the young people in and around our area. And yeah. And, and it's starting to become a really nice connection that's happening. But again, the same thing, you know, I, I heard at the National Sustainable Living Festival in Melbourne, I was, there were some of the, the key leaders in Australia there, and they, they made it really clear, like, this is our movement. Yeah. Don't come and take over and don't tell us what to do. Totally. Be there to support us. And so, but I'd, I'd like to sort of be there, sort of hands and arms open saying, you know, if, you, if you'd like, this is... Yeah, <laughs> this permaculture. <laughs> so how, how, what, a, what could be a way to, to make it visible, I suppose, to, as an option? Jenna, you know, was, I, uh, I did a, I taught a session at Schumacher College a little while ago mm. about, it was the first time I taught the full, well, like what's in this new book I've been doing. Yeah. And I did a session with them all day. And, um, and then about four days later was the first student march in mm. Exeter. So I'm at the student march. I went with my with my son just to support him and to be there because I really wanted to be there. It felt like a historical thing. So there was about 800 kids outside the county council offices making a load of noise and really great banners mm. and really humorous and fun and wonderful. And then after about an hour, they all kind of looked around and coming over the park towards them was another like another 400, like another great big group of kids who'd marched up from the university and picked up all the stragglers as they sort of came up, you know, and marching with this big school strikes for climate banner at the front. And there was this really magical moment where the two Mm -hmm. groups kind of merged into each other and sort of cheered each other together, you know. And then as I look at the back, coming up at the back, there was a massive banner that just said, what if, question mark on Mm. it. And, uh, and it was the students who'd been oh, in this yes. session I taught. So yes. this book I'm writing is called From What Is to What If. Yes. And so there was this banner that just said, mm. what if on it? And I was like, and it gave me goosebumps. <laughs> and, then, and then when they arrived, they did this thing where they had all these cards that just said, what if on? Yeah. And then they just asked kids to just fill I them out. I saw those up at Schumacher. I saw them up on the wall. Yeah, they were posted they were up there. really good. What they yeah. were, the stuff that was on there. And yeah. they got kids printing t-shirts with what if written on them and stuff. And asking them about yeah. that, you know. And, uh, you know, I think it's, it's, um, it felt like a really, it felt like a fascinating sort mm. of element that well, was, oops, that was, yeah. that, that, that was added into everything. Um, I guess, I mean, they, it feels like they're all kind of really open to ideas. Mm. Mm. You know, maybe the thing is just to set things up there or just yeah. to be there, yeah. you know. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. No, I don't know either, but... But I, it, it would be really, really sad if, 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 it, if it, you know, went the way of Occupy and those things that come up like a big souffle mm. and then go down again. It was like, well, what we really tried to do with Transition was, whoa, there's a souffle, quick, how do we put props in underneath <laughs> the souffle and then pump it up a bit more, you know? So actually, it, 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 it's, you know, the fact that Transition still exists after 12 years feels yeah. amazing to me because yeah. so many things like Occupy just yeah. come and go and come and go. And, but it's interesting, though, within um, the Transition movement, there's... You know the whole mo- the movement as a whole is still is still there, and but things within it can come and go, mm. which is which is perfect as well. And it's a little bit like your the the Tottenham's pound 
that there's an event tonight happening, yeah. isn't there? Which is kind of there's a. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the the rise and the? Yeah, there's a little oh. historical moment you're here for tonight. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so I've got it here actually. So, 12 years ago, I walked into a building on the high street and saw this, which is a which is a, a banknote from 1810 when the bank when there was a bank of Totnes that had its own that printed its own money, mm. and I saw this and I thought. Wow, that's so interesting. Yep. Maybe we could make some more. What yep. would happen? Would the Queen come round and you know smash my windows? <laughs> and uh, so we just did it to see. We printed three hundred. That on one side was a facsimile of this, and on the other side said these are the eighteen shops you can spend them in. Let's yep. see what happens. And then that went really well. So then we did another one pound note, and then another different one pound note, and then after a while we did a one five ten and a twenty one pound note. Um, can you just tell us about the twenty one pound note because that's a fascinating thing. Yeah, well, it wasn't our idea. We, we can. It was an idea we nicked off Lewis actually. Mm-hmm. So Transition Town Lewis, the Lewis mm-hmm. pound, they did a twenty one pound yeah. note, and I thought that is so cool. It's, and it was something to do with like old English money, which I don't understand yeah, at yeah, all. Right. It's like you know, eighteen groats makes a spigot and. You know, 15 shillings makes a twong or something, you know. But there was a thing called a guinea that was 21 Uh, something, 21 pounds or 21 shillings or some nonsense like that. And uh, so we thought, so that was was where they came from with it. But here here we did a 21 pound note partly because we just thought, well, why not? Actually, Mm -hmm. you can do whatever denominator. Why should we be tied to the same denominations as other money? But also because we did a thing called the economic blueprint in local economic yes. blueprint in Totnes. So we mapped the economy in Totnes and oh, said, wow. how much money do we spend on food, energy mm. and care every mm. year? And where does it go? And we found, for example, that we spend 30, pounds on, 30 million pounds on food every year, oh. of which 22 million at that time were spent in two supermarkets. Yes, so right. it meant that we could say mm. that if we could make a 10% shift collectively mm. away from mm. shopping there to supporting our local businesses, mm. that would be two million pounds in the economy every year. Mm. And so if, the te- if it was a 10% shift, if we made 21 pound notes and we sold them for 20 pounds, that was the 5%. Mm. So it was like saying to people, uh, mm-hmm. we'll give you the first 5% yep. and you do the other five. Yeah, yeah. So, the, so for the first six months or something, we sold 21 pound notes for 20 pounds. Mm. That was the idea. But then uh, also, I like you know in, people say, "Why do you have a twenty-one pound, 21 pound note?" We say, "Well, why not? Yes. You do what you like." Yes. You know. But then, so we did it. So then we we tried to have an electronic pound, mm. like they have in Bristol and other places. Mm. But we're just too small to get a critical mass yeah, for that. Okay. This is a town of nine thousand people. Yeah. You know. Uh, so what we found was over the last three or four years, because people use cash less and less, yeah, right. that the amount of trade was yeah, sort okay. of dwindling. Yeah. To a point where we thought we could just let it just sort of limble along mm-hmm. and just sort of peter out or we could just say okay we'll just stop it and have a big mm-hmm. celebration and celebrate what it was and yep. how the influence it's had on other people mm-hmm. and so what are the key things that you think that it, it helped to shift in people's mind having well it's funny I, I think you know it's like we can um so when you when you wrap up a project like that, there's mm. a part of you that thinks, oh, so it's a failure, you know. Like in our culture, you think, oh, well, you know, we did this, but it's mm. failed because it's not become the currency of choice of everybody in Totnes. Um, so uh, you know, I, the way I think of it is, if you look at it as we wanted this to become the the economic means of exchange mm. for everybody in Totnes, then it failed. Mm. If you wanted to look at it as something that put Totnes on the map Mm -hmm. as a place that does unique Mm -hmm. and uh, quirky things Mm -hmm. uh, and tries out brave ideas, Mm -hmm. then I think, you know, most people, if they know nothing about Totnes, they know that it it has had its own pound. If you want to look at it as uh, as an art project, Mm -hmm. you know, where we printed beautiful things Mm -hmm. and got people involved in a big Mm -hmm. participatory community arts project, I think it's been absolutely extraordinary. If you want to look at it as a project that was about getting people thinking about why the local economy matters Mm -hmm. and why we should support Mm -hmm. it, then I think it was really successful. Mm -hmm. And if you want to look at it as being an imagination project Mm -hmm. that was about getting people thinking about possibilities in Mm -hmm. different ways and and that it gave people the opportunity, people who visited Totnes, Mm -hmm. the opportunity to experience living as though there was another means of exchange then it was a real success. And also, I think if you want to see it as being a way of um, challenging the epidemic of loneliness mm. that we have at the moment. Mm. You know, there's beautiful research done in Bristol, which showed that when people went shopping with Bristol pounds, paper pounds, mm-hmm. they had so many more conversations than oh, when wow. you went shopping That's with plastic. And so my experience as somebody who did a lot of my shopping in Tottenham's pounds was, 
it was so much more of a conversation piece yeah. Yeah. and I had so much more interaction with other people you get them out oh interesting <laughs> oh I love it when people shop with you, oh, da, da. Yeah, you know yeah. and that experience of beautiful coloured notes that tell our mm. story yeah. and our history and mm. celebrate the people we celebrate and you know, for me, it's been kind of a magical thing, yeah, really, yeah. and and it's and also it's inspired so many other people. There's a lovely quote that I'll use tonight, which Thomas Edison said. You know, yeah, I had to make ten thousand light bulbs mm -hmm. before I made the first light bulb that was commercially viable. Does that mean that all the nine thousand nine hundred ninety-nine earlier light bulbs I made were failures? No, they were all successes mm -hmm. because they all helped me to realise what didn't work and got me to this point here. Mm -hmm. If you're a sculptor and you're making a statue, is the last hit of the hammer the successful one? Yeah. It's like, of course, it's all. Yeah. So for me, th this was one manifestation that's inspired people all around the world to take the idea and create their own versions. Yeah. And you were saying earlier that there's an enormous amount of local currencies around all throughout um, Europe now. You say. Yeah, everywhere I go, there's yeah. like, particularly in the French-speaking world, yeah. after that film Demain, the, yeah. where, in which I hold a 21 poet and say, well, why not, or something. <laughs> you know, actually, a lot of people came out of the cinema and were like, what can we do? Let's do that. Yeah, yeah. So I go to places where, I, the, where they have a... Uh, 2.5 notes or there's a currency launching that has 1, 3, 10 and 30 as their denominations or in Brussels and in Liège they have a zero note and I say why have you got a zero note and they say well you know because sometimes someone does something nice for you and you want to say thank you but you don't want to put a, a, an amount on it because that feels a bit mercenary but you just want to say thank you it's like a token of gratitude yeah. and then say pass it on to somebody else you know. Yeah. So and I love that kind of, uh, again, it's that if, if we're looking at these things as being an opportunity for creativity and playfulness mm -hmm. and conversation and connection, then, you know, I love that. Who mm -hmm. else is going to start a currency with a zero note and a yeah. 13 note? <laughs> That's such a fantastic you know? thing. I'm looking forward to tonight's event. But before we close up tonight, and I wish I did have a zero note to give to you to thank you, Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> um, any last thoughts about, you know, for people just entering into the world of becoming permaculture teachers. They're making the shift in their life to move yeah. from one to the other. And uh, what are some of the things that you think would be... So these are people who are working either with children or in community education particularly. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I think my main thinking is you know in the same way that, that that we are saying to local governments and businesses and education establishments you need to declare a climate emergency mm. i think it's a kind of a question for us as well mm. you know how would we operate it, it was what we, for me one of the motivations for starting the transition movement mm. was that i had my kind of climate change mm. dark night of the soul mm. and and i read david holmgren's book which said permaculture is the design uh, tool for creating the society in response to this mm. and I felt so kind of like right this is mm. when we storm the barricades this mm. is our moment these things are coming together now is the time and I can look round with the permaculture community around mm. me at the time mm. who actually most of whom seemed quite happy to be up a little farm somewhere making mm. chairs out of sticks mm. do you know what I mean yeah. and, 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 and I was and so for me Transition was me trying to design a kind of Trojan horse yeah. that I could chuck permaculture in and Joanna Macy mm. in and stuff mm. like that. And mm. I didn't have to spend hours explaining it with flip charts and pictures of chickens and arrows and orchards. I could just wheel it past and then go, oh, it's that transition thing. <laughs> but it had all the other stuff in it yeah. and it could just wheel past with its little yeah. squeaky wooden wheels and they'd go, oh, it's a, it's a transition, you know. And, uh, you know, so for me, the, I, the, the frustrations that I have with, with the permaculture movement is, you know, why is it that after 40 whatever it is mm. years of permaculture, maybe there is in Australia mm. now, but there's not here, you know, why do we not have really professional design consultancies mm. who are tendering for bids for big parks mm. and who are tendering for the Olympics mm. uh, and who are tendering to to do edible landscapes mm. around business parks mm. and who are upping the game mm. uh, to that extent you know who are going to big football clubs and saying mm. you know can we put in can we grow hops all over the outside of the mm. building can we mm. uh, um, you know, if, if this is a climate emergency, it's not enough just for us to say, all those people need to up their game. Mm. You know, for me, there's something about saying, we have to be creating, we have to be creating the, the, the new businesses. We need yeah. to be thinking yeah. and working in the way that the people 
uh, you know, when I spend time with entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. their brain works in a completely mm -hmm. different way. I talked about how mm -hmm. permaculture rewired my brain. Yeah. You know, I spend time with people who are really brilliant entrepreneurs, and I think your brain is wired in a completely different way to mine. Mm -hmm. And that ability to think, okay, so we can start with this and then move that over there, mm -hmm. and then we'll use that to do that, and then. Uh, and then that's how we create the scale. Yeah. You know, for me now, the question is about scale. Yeah. How do we scale this stuff? Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, the, the beautiful thing about imagination for me is that imagination flourishes when it has limits. Mm -hmm. If I said, uh, tell me a story, mm -hmm. you'd be like, uh, uh, uh. if I said, okay, tell me, the, tell me a story about a mouse that lives under the table mm -hmm. in a giant's house. Mm -hmm. You'd be like, okay, so he, yeah, you know, so or, or like Dr. Seuss writing a mm. book with fifty words, or mm. haikus, or hip hop, you know, mm. where you have a, a form that inspires that creativity. For me, a climate emergency is is totally that, mm. you know, and and it, and it gives us, and, and so for me, I think we need to be thinking about how do we embrace the, the, the possibilities of a climate emergency mm. to completely scale up what we're talking about in permaculture. Mm. Permaculture should be completely mainstream mm. and it should be like every TV soap opera should have permaculture gardens and mm. somebody who's in there, you know, where are the, where are the great transition storytellers, script mm. writers mm. who are writing those films and those stories? Mm. You know, where, where are the, the, the TV producers who, who, who have done the permaculture training? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like for me, this is the time now where you know, there's an amazing, in London, there's, there's guys who created, the in Chris, Transition Town Crystal Palace, mm -hmm. started a new food market. Mm. Amazing. And they've won all the best market in London mm -hmm. awards, and it's fantastic. And I said to them, why do you do this? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and they said, because we want our children to grow up thinking that this is normal. Yeah. And there's something for me about how we make this normal. Mm. And, uh, and I think, uh, uh, in, you know, and there are a lot of people within the kind mm -hmm. of permaculture world who who are really who and it's it's a, it it's less like this than it was 10 years ago but it's still to a degree that thing of wanting to change the world mm -hmm. but not really wanting to engage with the world mm -hmm. it's like wanting to sort of opt out of the world yeah. but somehow get it to change at the same time yeah. if you want to get the world to change you have to roll yeah. your sleeves up yeah. you have to speak their language mm -hmm. you have to wear a shirt sometimes yeah. and and be able to speak in their language yeah. and put a tender together for a for a landscaping project and mm. a construction project and we need to have natural building companies who can tender for housing developments mm. and who know where the coal where the clay is mm. and who have teams of trained up professional clay plasterers mm. who can come in mm. Do you know we need to scale this shit up really fast yep. and that requires a kind mm. of a um in the, and, the, and for me the climate emergency thinking is the perfect kind mm. of narrative to mm. frame that around well with that I have to say thank <laughs> you so much. <laughs> no, it's perfect because <laughs> it is. We we do. We we have the skills. We have this global network that communicates together and having the motivation to as you say, scale it up and really get it out mm. is, is, is right where we need to be. And but that's totally in our hands. You mm. know, it's like it's not in we, there's we can no longer sit and say they need to do this, they need yeah, to do yeah. that. You know, we've we, got all this yeah. stuff. We have to. I remember I interviewed Michael Schumann, mm. who wrote all the Go Local stuff. You know, oh, yeah, and yeah. I said, what advice would you have for people? Mm. And he said, go to business school. Yeah. You know, in terms of you know, we need to be thinking in that yeah. kind of a way and making jobs for people yeah. because if, if because as long as we aren't creating livelihoods for mm. people, then we're relying on volunteers. Yeah, and right. if we're relying on volunteers, then it'll always remain a mostly white middle class movement. Exactly. It's when we can start, like you see in Jackson mm -hmm. and in Detroit yeah, and yeah. in and in Richmond, California, yeah. where people have got nothing yeah. and they're using permaculture and cooperative yeah. principles to rebuild the economy. Yeah. You know, that's what yeah. we need to be doing. So I just met up with Davida um, Davison recently who runs a food lab in Detroit and she was saying exactly that. You know, mm. all that vacant land, you know, it, it shrunk from, what, 2.5 million people down to six or 700,000 yeah. and all this vacant land but and only the poorest of the poor pretty much left and how they're starting to turn that around with with um, with permaculture gardens mm. and, and um, food enterprises and it is about, um, it is about creating sustainable or regenerative livelihoods for people not about mm. just doing community gardens and I absolutely think it's, it's i think it was where i was sort of starting to have a chat earlier about you know why why in kinsale did you know do people spend two years doing that you know it's it's, it's that the livelihood at the end of things and i think as a permaculture educator 
there's a livelihood in that, but there's a livelihood so many different ways in, mm. in doing permaculture. And I think embracing that sounds like where we need to go. There's a woman called Daria Robinson in Richmond who okay. runs a thing called Urban Tilth, who's one of my total heroes teaching young people to become urban food growers mm. in that place and we did a talk together and uh, and I talked about this and said you know well if if we if we imagine we're going to do everything mm. with volunteers we're not going to get anywhere mm -hmm. she said if this is a revolution that depends on volunteers I can't be part of it mm. and nor can anyone where I live people are working six days a week yep. four jobs to keep the roof over their heads yep. we can't be part of this if that's the idea yep. you know yeah great thank you so much Rob. thank you my pleasure <laughs> thank you